<laughs> Hello, Rao. Uh, welcome to my show, Bollywood to Hollywood. Welcome to my, <laughs> welcome to the set of <laughs> medicine <laughs> show theater. Yeah. Uh, it, it might surprise the audience why we are here in this uh, theater, and uh, you have a show called The Crazy Lady of Shayo. Uh, let me introduce to the audience uh, first. Uh, um, this is Barbara Van, uh, artistic director of the Medicine Show Theater, and they're having a, a French play. Uh, you'll be surprised in New York they're having a French play. So it's titled uh, Crazy Lady of Shayo by John Ziradu. <laughs> I guess that is how the French say. <laughs> so, Barbara, tell me about this play. Why you choose a French play? Oh, um, I, I knew you were going to ask that. I, I, I like this play very much, and um, it has never been, well, actually it has, I found out, recently been translated in its entirety at, Tu at Tufts College, but I didn't know about it. So for me, this is the first total translation of the play. A lot of the plays that one knows about, this is La Folle de Chaillot in French, or usually it's translated as the Mad Woman of Chaillot. We're calling it the Crazy Lady to separate it from that adaptation, um, which takes out a lot of the meat and the politics and what was considered off-color um, humor in the 50s, in America in the 50s were very um, uh, squeaky clean and... Um, well, they came right after the war. Yes, the and president. Eisenhower was elected president. I, I, I was in high school and I, I couldn't believe that Stevenson wasn't elected president because we were taught that intelligence was what was uh, important, uh -huh. but it wasn't. And now Eisenhower's look, well, it doesn't matter, we won't go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, time. French play. So, so, yeah, why, so why this, uh, uh, this his play is, instead of maybe Paul Sartre or... Well, um, I read it in French and it just seemed uh, like a very exciting project. Uh, it talks a lot about what was wrong with the world it was written during the 40s, and it wasn't produced when, when Paris was occupied by the Germans. And it wasn't produced until 1945. Um, but there are lots of little undercover humoresque things about the occupation through the course of the play. Um, and they wouldn't have let it be uh, pro produced Produce, yeah. Yeah, while the Germans were still there. Um, uh, and it also talks about a lot of the problems that were starting at that point. And they weren't considered problems, they were considered growth and development and all of that, mm -hmm. that have come to um, <laughs> yokes around our necks now, including voracious digging for oil. Um, the the, the awesome. joke, if you will. Mm -hmm of the piece is that these prospectors have found oil under Paris and are planning to drill for it. Um, and the, the crazy lady and her friends stop this, this process. I, I just want to read this because I, I was reading this... Um, what did this This, this is a, a book of Gertrude Stein's called Paris, France. And it was written at the same time um, during the 40s. And uh, she, she talks about... Um, uh, uh, this farmer saying to her, um, we used to think, not we, but everybody used to think, that it was kings who were ambitious, who were greedy, and who brought misery to the people who had no way to resist them. But now, well, democracy has shown us that what is evil are the gros tête, the big heads, or the fat heads, I would translate it. All big heads are greedy for money and power, they are ambitious. That is the reason they are big heads. And so they are at the head of the government, and the result is misery for the people. And um, this is supposedly said by a farmer. And it is the, um, the rise of the grosse tête, if you will, that um, has led to 
you know, what we now talk about the 1% as opposed to the 99%. And I remember saying as a child in some piece we were working on, there's so much money in the world, why, is it, why isn't everybody comfortable and happy and all of that stuff? It seems, you know, well, we all know that it's, so it this, seems this, morally wrong. Yes, yeah, it, it seems like it has relevance to these present times with the recession going on. And, rich, and, rich are becoming rich and poor are becoming poor. And, even in a, and oh yes, the, even the, here the, in the rich are richer and the poor are poorer in America than they were in the 1800s. Yeah. Um, so it has a more relevance to the present times. That and also uh, and also the uh, rapacious drilling for oil and gas that goes on all over America. Um, yeah, they're going to Alaska now. The pipeline and all that. And and, and fracking. Um, you know, planning to tear the tops off all the mountains in New York State and Pennsylvania and, and spoil the drinking water and, um, you know, do anything that'll make a buck. Um, <laughs> so it has relevance to the present time. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, um, well, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> It would be better for all of us if it didn't have any relevance. It's also very funny because it is for crazy ladies who find the way of destroying um, the oil conglomerate, as you would call it. And um, you know, there's a line in the play where where I say to one of the characters, "What do you make with? What do they, what are they what are they looking for?" And he says, "Oil." And I say, well, "What do they what do they plan to make with it?" And he says, what one makes with oil, uh, miser misery, poverty, a, a wretched life. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, we, live, uh, we have been a, a male challenged, basically uh, male dominated society. Now the author using females uh, to to overthrow the kind of evil, or, or fight the evil. So is it uh, we are going to a matriarchy rather than a patriarchy? <laughs> it was supposedly a, suge a suggestion of Louis Jouvet, who played the rag picker in the original production, to Giraudoux, that he write a play uh, using as stars, I mean this is of course another reason that I was interested in it, for, as we say now, older women. Um, so of course they had to be crazy, or I mean, women on older women on the stage either have to be crazy or harpies or you know, witches or um, uh, bacante or something. But anyway, um, yeah, it's great. To, it's great to have a big part as an older woman and a comic part, and uh, then to have several of them in it. Um, very few plays of the period. I'm trying to think of any. Oh, there was a play that we did. Um, th this is how mistranslations happen mm -hmm. and adaptations. There is a play called L'Invitation au Chateau by Anneuil, um, the, An Invitation to the Chateau. It is tr everybody knows it in its, trans in its adaptation as Ring Around the Moon, and it's quite charming. The only thing they left out was that the character who is the, the, the reason for this party at the Chateau, and who is a very rich man, and da 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 da, has just come back from a concentration camp where all those nice people at the Chateau, where they you know, waved goodbye, allowed him to go, because the French were not madly defensive of their Jewish population. Well, they cut that out entirely, mm -hmm. and it is rather the point of the play. Um, and the only thing in the play that has, you know, <coughs> other than that, it's a little love story dancing around it, because you always have to have little love stories dancing around it. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of adaptations they did in the 50s. Um, and that's where, you know, that's when they were drilling for oil, and that's when they were making America rich, and that's when, you know, all of that was happening, although there are those who say that um, we got out of the Depression. And I don't know about this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a really um, on the nail-on-the-head political uh, savant, 
Um, but I have heard it said that we got out of the Depression by selling arms and oil and things like that to Europe. Europe. And I'm also thinking, um, is it the uh, political aspect of his class struggle is that attracted, or is the comedy of uh, satire next behind his play exposing the whole? Well, I've studied the ideas of comedy a lot. Uh -huh. Since I like comedy better than tragedy, um, tragedy seems so commonplace. Yeah, so this is not a political <laughs> but, play. This but, is but, more... but my favorite definition of comedy um, is we, we laugh at what should not be. Mm -hmm. And if you make these, these gros têtes, these fatheads, into comic characters, if you made war something that people would laugh at, if you made money grubbing, you know, as stupid as a kid stuffing his mouth with a hamburger, you know, then maybe we would move toward a more intelligent society. And medicine shows are the only American form of entertainment. And in a way, it's it's sort of funny going looking at this because they sold a product as well <laughs> as well as um, uh, giving it doing entertainment. Um, and it I don't know someone suggested it, it seemed like a good name at the time. Is it an but, offshoot of uh, group theater or something? We were in the, the no, it was the, an offshoot of the open theater. Oh, okay. Um, and, um, you have nothing to do with the group theater? Of the 30s? Yeah. No, I, we did a piece uh, about the group theater and about... Um, a, a, there was a, pro, a part of the WPA program um, had a theater group for a few years until the Un-American Activities Committee <laughs> decided that they were doing work that was too left-wing. Um, and. Uh, you know, that's where... Uh, um, yeah, they, they have bla blacklisted a lot of famous actors. And oh, no, that was in the 50s. The, yeah. black, the blacklisting was in the 50s. The Federal Theater Project was in the 30s. Um, and it was fabulous. I mean, it, it, it actually, like, like uh, Belgium and France... Belgium, if you're an unemployed artist, you get paid. You, you get paid unemployment because they know you'd rather be working than not working, and so you you know you don't have to. Um, I mean, you know, the the kids working on this piece. I mean, work all night as waiters and all day as you know, or all day as waiters and all night rehearsing, and you know, it's a nightmare. Um, I'm trying. So, to medicine show brings uh, somehow. I mean, <clears throat> fills that gap well, where somebody, the federal theater left. Well. You Not know, we're, we're one of, you know, like the living theater, like the open theater, we, we try to do touchy material. I mean, granted, we can't always. We're, we're poor, and we're not highly subsidized. And this year, for some interesting and bizarre reason, although we have supposedly a small grant from the New York State Council on the Arts, we haven't seen it yet. It's tied up in Albany somewhere. So, uh, you know, after touring Europe with a piece that got awards all over Europe, we came back and did it in New York, and nobody came to see it or nobody had heard about it. We did a Cole Porter musical and filled the house. So, we, you know, we've been doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that to stay alive, and we do it fairly well. But we are too poor to qualify for grants to small to poor theaters. We're, we're too poor to be poor, you know, too poor to be poor. Mm -hmm. uh, our budget isn't big enough to qualify. It's kind as, of an irony. Yes, it is an irony. You were talking about the federal theater. Oh, at some point I was talking about the federal theater project. Um, uh, people, if they know it for from anything, would know it from the Cradle Will Rock because there was there was a whole scandal and they um, stopped stopped the production of it and. Um, and then, of course, then that the um, the Dyes Committee, the House on American Activities Committee, I, I, they were called something else at the time, mm -hmm. um, put an end to it after two years. But it was a great experiment. Um, and you know, then after that, um, 
we were talking about. Then the move, the experimental theater movement of the '60s that that I was involved with um, had a lot to do also with ways of expressing non-realistic material. And um, it, a well, lot what of what do you it, mean by non-realistic? Well, the plays of Arabal and and Ionesco, and um, you know there there was a and even even these plays, um, you know, the Darius Mio was he was one of the six, mm -hmm. the six, and 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 their mater the material was not it was not it was post romantic, um, the the music is not romantic, the the plays are not about um, the struggle of a fan you know the real semi realism. Um, in the open theater, we did a short play um, that Jean Claude Van Utali wrote. That I don't remember the play. It was it was mocking Doris Day. She was the blonde of the fifties. Just hi, and I'm wonderful, and I'm this, and she's supposedly a very nice woman. But anyway, um, and it was called "It's Almost Like Being" because there was a song called "It's Almost Like Being in Love," and we did "It's Almost Like Being," and having. Art was taking, you know, Paco this was written at the same uh, crazy uh, crazy yes. lady or Fal de Chaillot mm -hmm. was written at the same time that Picasso was painting, and Matisse and and the, then their guys that were had not had new ideas about reality, um, or maybe wanted to reject the reality that there was. I mean, if if the reality is war and greed, then maybe art does want to go somewhere else and touch you at another part of the imagination than that logical place that leads to um, working nine to five in an office that you hate um, for somebody else to get rich. Um, this is so rather uh, what is life should be rather than what it is. Yes, or or just another way of looking at it. Um, the, you know. <sighs> when I used to work nine to five, then I became an actor, and it was difficult. But then I realized it was liberating not to sit there in the chair, nine to five, for how many years? So Forty years, thirty years. Somebody told me, uh, life is like a piano. It's a lot of people that work nine to five. They play only one note, <laughs> and there are so many other notes on the piano, so you're missing the a song of the life. So maybe that's what they have in mind, and maybe I'm putting it very crudely. No, I think it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's very clear. Um, oh, to go back, mm -hmm. just another little fact, we are called Medicine Show, but we had to be called Medicine Show Theatre Ensemble because uh, I just want to be medicine show. Um, medicine shows are Ill, are illegal in the United States since 1905. Oh, I didn't know that. So I you, think not many people know that. No, there's no reason to know it. So we had to change our name and make it clear that we were not really a medicine show selling um, vile drugs. Oh. Um, and that's another whole wonderful story, I suppose, of when drugs became you know, when they were permissible, when they were non-permissible, when there was prohibition, when there was not prohibition, when there was this and that and the other thing, and, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that they will legalize marijuana when they can find, when they can tax it. <laughs> and, some, and somebody, right, and somebody can become the marijuana producer of, uh, you know, and make a lot of money from it. Now that's, you know, now that I guess the cigarette companies are, must be losing money to some extent, I don't know. Maybe uh, they move into marijuana. No. <laughs> I just have a, another thought. Uh, uh, there was a movie also with Catherine Hepburn. Oh, that was awful. Uh -huh. um, so you, you played that, the character. Yeah, but that, that, that is also from the Valenci uh, adaptation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very, very pretty. And uh, 
uh, I didn't see much of it. I, I actually fell asleep looking at it, uh, which I never do. Um, so you are bringing the real spirit in its fullest form. Oh yes, it's scruffy. I mean, the people, most of the people in this in the piece are they're working class. They they work in this cafe, and then there are the rich ones who are planning to knock down Paris and drill for oil, but um, but. Uh, it has a, you know, a kind of raucous, ramshackle, improvisational feeling that I find is very hard to get in film. Um, that's, you know, I prefer theater to film or television or anything else that's mechanical because you never really know what's going to happen. And there is always that moment-to-moment -moment possibility that either something wonderful will happen or somebody will fall down and that and everybody will laugh you know but it's plus you have the relationship with the other people in the audience and it is so it's some kind of a you know a group ceremony in a way um, so that's another reason why they should come to our show and watch this uh, well, of course you should come to our show and watch this. We put in a lot of work, and there are 20-odd people in it. Well, how did you pick some of these people? Well, I like working with people I know, so a lot of them I know. Um, some of them... You're playing the crazy lady. I'm right? playing one of the four crazy ladies. Mm -hmm. I know the other three <laughs> from other productions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you gave me a doctor. Uh, yes, he's uh, playing the, the doctor. Um, but there are other wonderful actors on this on this set. Uh, um, and I'm trying to think. I think only one or two of the actors. This is the first time I've ever seen them. Um, I mean, I was lucky with it. There's nobody, you know. I mean, there are occasionally strange people that you meet as actors. But I have found in my life that the artists I know are somehow less strange. <laughs> Crazy is too strong a word for television. Um, but a little less strange than the business people I have met. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you think that everybody that you know is, well, then we're artists and we're, we're loonies and we're this and we're that. And, um, and then you meet, um, you know, the ones who live in the town that your daughter lives in or something like that and they're like wow they are out there as well but not n not for pleasure i mean when when artists go bananas they go bananas for pleasure i mean i don't mean really bananas but it's, it's difficult but, to support themselves though right artists yeah. well in this country yes which is why i mean i know I know a lot of artists who are working in Europe most of the time now because um, I remember when I first went to, to France, um, uh, it, then it said on your passport you had to put down what you, your, your profession and I had to write down actor and we got to this hotel and I was afraid that you know they would look at it and say no you can't stay here we don't want any of you. Uh, ne'er do wells, and instead they opened. They said, "Oh, but you're an artist," and it was like, "Oh!" Some and, and a friend of mine who was a poet um, said when he went to France, they, they said, "Oh, you're a poet." That's instead of what do you real what do you do for a living, <laughs> or what do you really do? That that's what they would usually say. What well, yeah, what do you really do? But no, there's a you know, somebody else said that. Uh, Europe, they, they respect an artist. They even declare a national holiday when an artist dies. Oh, not in America. No, really. not in America. Artists are So not. that's more so a reason for the audience who is watching it to come and uh, see the show and support us. Come and see this show! <laughs> uh, the Crazy Lady of Shio medicine show. And uh, we have this uh, show this whole month of April, right? All of April. All of April, uh, except you, you, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Well, yeah, and you can call, it's 549 West 52nd Street, 212-262-4444. Mm -hmm. 
4216. Or you can go to our website, medicineshowtheater.org. That's theater, T-H-E-A-T-R-E, -E, medicineshowtheater.org. And that will tell you everything. Yeah, they make a reservation. Well, I don't know if you can make a reservation. Yeah, but you can buy tickets on Smart Ticks, Smart. or you can call us, or you can do it somehow. Um, I am... I mean, I'm technically challenged, but uh, just because I'm lazy. Um, well, it's not only they'll have a, a, a they'll be supporting the show and the artists, but they're also getting a, 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 a good uh, kickback for what they're paying for. It. Yeah, well, and we always allow people to if if you're if the price is too high for you and. And I mean really, and for some people it is, and for some people they'll take a cab here and have dinner after and still want to pay the lowest price, but that's a whole other story. Um, if the price is too high for you, make a contribution of some kind and we won't turn you away. Mm -hmm. And this is that's a non-profit to one and, and it's a non-profit organization. And they can even contribute to end the year, the, all through the year, especially with the taxes. <laughs> yes, or as every organization that I... Um, have anything to do with tells me you can leave us in uh, uh, you can put us in your will. <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know that I'll be around that long. <laughs> no, there will be people that will be no. your legacy. Yeah, I I, oh, I don't know about well. We'll see. <laughs> well, actually, my grandson's a, a good actor, mm -hmm. so we'll see what happens. Well, uh, I know time is very short. We can't talk about the whole play in this half an hour, uh, but uh, it is more so a reason for them to come and see the real show, and, uh, and this is the set. This is the, this is the second act set. The yeah. first act set is at a cafe, and you get to see people move furniture around too. Yeah. Not only. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and what? Um, so here we are. Well, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Thank to you. our show, Bollywood <laughs> to Hollywood, uh, whatever it, it means, but I think we, we are up for theater supporting, and I'm also in the play, so. <laughs> and he's funny, and he has a funny scene. And, yeah. um...